ability that that show would have probably been one of the more popular ones on the WRU airwaves. Absolutely. I mean, we, we had a lot of, cause that's a, that's a popular time of day to turn on radio in that area. Um, so I think that, you know, when, again, we were kind of competing against the big name talk shows, you know, you, you had to go up against the, the midday shows at EEI and at the sports hub. But, um, I remember we did get a call one time about a guy who's very upset. We were talking about, uh, uh, there was a, a fine arts graduate, somebody in the theater department who won yeah. like a major award. And this person yeah. calls in who, who is a fine arts graduate as well and was upset because it, he thought we were putting a negative light on the department. And no, 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 we're praising the department. So it's just like this guy who, you know, is listening to our show is a fine arts guy like you i just would never have thought that i would only think like local sports people would want to listen to the show but it, it, the audience was wide yeah it was it definitely was i mean the wru audience was uh was super wide i remember one time i was in middle of nowhere connecticut and i was seeing wru bumper stickers there was a couple of times you know northern rhode island closer to burville and you know, I'm walking around the WRIU sweatshirt and then people coming up to me and talking, you talking to me about WRIU and their experiences with WRIU. And uh, I, I think that was something that I didn't appreciate till my senior year. I mean, I had been a part of WRU since my freshman year, been on the executive board sophomore year and up. But kind of the minute I took general manager role was the minute that I realized how big WRU actually was. And then once you realize that, you kind of take a step back and it kind of becomes daunting almost mm -hmm. when you realize how many people are listening. And then you're like, Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm an 18, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kid trying to figure this all out. Um, but then you realize that everyone there kind of, I, I don't want to say doesn't care, but I think WRU was always so great because you could make mistakes and you didn't have mm -hmm. to have perfect program. And it was kind of what made WRU unique. I remember uh, one of the things that the great Maureen McDermott said to me was, WRU is perfect because it is not perfect. And then once mm -hmm. I kind of ran with that mantra, uh, the duties became a lot easier and much more manageable too, I think. Absolutely. You have to understand that it's, as a college kid in that role, uh, you're going to make mistakes. And I, I, I learned that oh, yeah. on the first day on the job. Uh, we were faced with one of the biggest decisions the station has seen, at least since I was there. Uh, and, yeah. and I knew that, you know, this was not going to be an easy ride. Uh, but we'll, we'll start there, I guess, and, and just say, like, how um, you alluded to it. You said you joined the station and, and, you know, the sports broadcasting department when you were a freshman uh, and, and yeah. made your way all the way up in a, in a pretty much the exact same path that I did. You went from sports comm sophomore year to uh, assistant general manager junior year, who, why I say, was you were an incredible right-hand man, a, a true oh, person <laughs> to lean on in, in a time of need. But uh, just that, that whole kind of path that you took all the way up to general manager, uh, what was your decision-making process? Did you see yourself as a GM uh, early? When did you see yourself as the GM Talk about just like your career specifically, your movement through college sports radio. It, it's funny because I still remember my, I, I could tell you exactly my first broadcast, like verbatim for verbatim. And I remember who I did it with and where it was and what sport it was. And it was a rainy woman's soccer game. It was me, Greg, and uh, Sam Murray. And I remember afterwards, I thought I did terrible. It was probably the worst broadcast I'd ever done. And I remember right after that, I was like, I don't think I, I don't think I'm made for sports radio, man. And I kind of just kept coming to meetings and kept interacting with you guys and just made friends. And, you know, for a period, I was kind of thinking, I guess I'm going to do sports journalism and not do sports radio, but I'll stay with WRU because this is where I made my friends. And eventually, you know, I would kind of just take studios just to take studios. And uh, I took I think I took the PC game studio my freshman year and Ben Kinch rewarded me by giving me an FM broadcast. And I didn't know anything about soccer, so I knew I was going to do a soccer, a soccer broadcast terribly. And then once I did basketball, I, I felt a little bit more comfortable, and I got to know Ben a little bit more. And Ben one day invited me on uh, Sports Power Half Hour as a freshman, and the minute I did the Sports Power Half Hour, everything changed. And I went from wanting to do sports broadcasting to sports radio. Mm -hmm. And then once I wanted to do sports radio, and I knew that's where I wanted to be, that – 
initially I said, okay, I want to continue work up WRIU. Uh, I think it was Sam who asked me at the end of my freshman year if I'd be interested in sports comm. I said yes. Uh, I did everything I had to do. That's one of those positions where you're kind of just there to be there, and it's really good just to see how the board runs, how the operations go. Um, and then you had asked me to be your uh, assistant general manager, and I said yes. And that was kind of really – even when I went into being assistant GM, I remember I, – I will always remember this. It was at a um, – Accepted Students Day, I think. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. Accepted Students Day at the Ryan Center. And we were all there. And I remember I was talking with uh, John Brock, who was the FM program director. And John came over to me and he was like, hey, you know, have you thought about what you're going to do for next year? And I was like, well, you know, it, it, it seems like I'm going to be GM. You know, I'm assistant general manager. You know, it, it all kind of seems like that's where it's going. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, the, the plan was to have McKenzie be GM from like the rip. And I was like, oh, well, well now I don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> and, and then I talked to McKenzie and I was like, hey, you know, like, what do you want to do? Like, you know, John said you were interested in being GM. And like right now I'm assistant GM. And we were in like this weird predicament because we were all going to be seniors. And the way the board had always seemed to run is – it seemed like, okay, your assistant GM was a junior who then took it, and then the person that you were going to bring up would be a sophomore, and yada, 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 and mm-hmm. it kind of just went right. on uh, this ladder almost. And she was like, well, you know, I'm going to graduate early, and then I was like, all right, well, screw it, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be GM. And I actually, at first, Jack, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I almost didn't want to do it because, you know, the situation that we had going on when you were general manager and I was like, damn, you know, I don't want all this responsibility, mm-hmm. you know, I, I wanted to be able to kind of enjoy my uh, – enjoy my senior year but you know I ended up having my internship with the sports of my junior year and uh, I figured well the only way to kind of get in this business is to do as much as you can so I figured I would take the general manager role and kind of take my own spin on it and you know I didn't look at it as being like a manager because I at the time like I said I was I was doing internships at the radio station and I realized that my role wasn't the most important role at the station. Mm-hmm. Like the program director was just as important. The sports department was just as important. And I think once I got over the fear that like I was head honcho was when everything kind of started to go a little bit more smooth. And uh, I mean, that's really it. I mean, I-, I was blessed that you guys had asked me to be a part of it. I mean, I would have never done it if you guys never asked me. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think I would have ever had the initiative to kind of be like, okay, I want to do it. Uh, but the minute, you know, Ben had asked me to come on the show and then you had asked me to be your assistant GM and just kind of so on and so forth was um, was really all the story. I mean, it's you're really only as great as people let you be. And, you know, you guys were always there and wanted me around. And I said, I mean, I'm not going to go anywhere else. You know, I wasn't part of the cigar. I wasn't part mm-hmm. of anything else. So uh, it only made sense. Yeah. I, I mean, at that time, I think. You know, as I think one of the biggest responsibilities as a general manager or sports director or program director is to uh, recruit and essentially be a scout uh, for your position, for other positions. And, you know, what stood out to me about you was, uh, like you said, you weren't necessarily ready to take that initiative. But once we, you know, kind of opened the door, Ben opened the door with the Sports Power Half Hour for you your ability showed. That's where it was uh, kind of the opening point for you. And I knew from there, I knew that you were going to be dedicated enough to work hard. And that's why I knew that you'd fit the AGM role the best. But it's an interesting story about uh, the whole story with you and Mackenzie. And uh, that was never even in my mind. You know, I had I had talked to her and I think we actually all sat down for a meeting and just said, you know, hey, what's the plan here? You, what, what do you feel most comfortable and she kind of stepped back and said, hey, you know, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I knew that both of you would have done a fine job. Obviously, you did a fantastic job with it. But uh, it, it's – it's, I guess where I'm going with this is the general manager, the executive board position, it gives you kind of this um, open door uh, experience that you could say, look, I, I handled this as a 21-year-old. You know, and you're right. It's not once you get over the fear of you have to run the whole thing by yourself. You don't have to run the whole thing by yourself, but it's still a big ask. And, and I yeah, think yeah, you, that that kind of says, you know, to have the confidence and the, you know, the will to do that says a lot in your character. 
and it opened the door for you for internships. You interned with the sports hub. You you got a job right out of school while you were still in school uh, with a major yeah. sports radio station. So uh, let's shift there now. Let's talk about your mm-hmm. experience with the sports hub, how you got there, how you were able to make your mark there, and kind of how that led you to where you uh, where you are today. Yeah, and similar to how at WRIU, I wouldn't have been anywhere at WRIU if it wasn't for you guys. I wouldn't have been anywhere for, if, at the sports hub if it wasn't for Stone Freeman. And I, I always say this to everyone, which is when people ask me, like how, like, how did you get to where you were? Like, even now at WEI, I wouldn't be at WEI if it was not for Stone Freeman. And there was one day I was just chilling in the office, the WRU executive board office, and Stone came in. And I remember... I don't I, envy may be the wrong word, but Stone it always seemed like had this new internship like every other week. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. <laughs> Stone would have some internship, and then in like two weeks had something else, and then like another two weeks had something else. And he came in one day, and I just outright asked him. I was like, Stone, how the hell do you get all these internships, dude? I was like, I don't know where to look. I don't know who to email. I have no idea. And Stone at the time was interning something for the Patriots radio network. And he said, uh, you know, I'll, I'll hook you up. Uh, this individual who was the producer for the Zolak and Bertrand show, he, they said they were looking for an intern. Uh, he would pass me his email and I got into contact with him. Uh, they took me in an interview. They liked me. And then I went up there and I started, uh, my first internship was with the Zolak and Bertrand show. I was just kind of like a production assistant and they liked me there it was a great time. I liked it there. All the guys were super cool, super nice. And that internship had ended. And I remember when that internship had ended, I had talked to, um, you know, to my boss or my supervisor, whatever you want to say. And we were at the time, you know, he was trying to find me some type of summer job, but it would have been kind of weird. Cause I had, you know, summer job back in Rhode Island and it wouldn't have been consistent hours. And I knew I couldn't leave you know my consistent you know 30 to 40 hour week summer job in rhode island for Mm. you know a once every other week thing in in boston massachusetts so i had planned this trip to italy and i was going to go to italy for two weeks starting on let's say august 14th so i was going to be going august 14th to the 28th and it's like august 10th and i get an email from the sports hub asking if i would want to do another internship with them and i was like well I'm not going to say no. You mm-hmm. know, I was like, I have this trip to Italy and I had to be there on August 19th and it was for the Patriots. So I had to be there every single Patriots Sunday from preseason to whenever the season was going to end. Mm-hmm. So I can't, I call my dad. I'm like, dad, we, we got to cancel this trip to Italy. He's like, what the hell? What do you mean we have to cancel this trip to Italy? You know, we <laughs> all this money for plane tickets. And, and I was like, dad, like, I, I'm not going to Italy. You know, if you want to take the tickets and go, you can go, but I'm not going to Italy. So I cancel my trip to Italy and you know, when I went for the, the interview for the second one, uh, one of the things that stuck out to me that they said to me was the individual who inter- uh, interviewed me said that I reminded him a lot of himself when he was a kid because he was general manager at his college radio station at BU. And it was one of those things that the minute that that happened, I said, okay, like this is where WRU has paid off for me. Mm-hmm. So I did those two internships. And at the end of the second internship, I kind of just took the initiative and I knew from when I was at 985 the sports sub that nothing was ever going to be handed to you. I knew at WRU, nothing was ever really handed to me. I mean, you get the opportunities, like people will hand you an opportunity, but from there it's up to you to do mm-hmm. something with it. So I just kind of blasted my resume um, all over the place and my resume and a couple of just draft emails and I wasn't expecting anything out of it. It was just a random day in you know, January. And WEI was the first one to get back to me. And I went up there for an interview and it was the same thing. You know, they liked the kid who was general manager of his college station, had done two internships, uh, had had experience doing broadcast and had had experience running the board. And, you know, ultimately that was, that was why they took me. And, um, you know, that's why I'm there now. You know, I, I, I have no problem saying I wouldn't, I wouldn't be at WEI. I wouldn't have had a job when I was still in college if it wasn't for WRU. How was it? Uh, I only see this guy from the outside and and not being a Patriots fan. I can only take him in bits and pieces. How is it working with Scott Zolak? (laughs) Uh, I'll tell you one thing, man. Like 
uh, that was one of the questions that everyone asked me to start. And they were always like, how's Zo? How's Zo? How's Zo? Mm-hmm. And he's the same person off air as he is on air, man. Uh, he's, he's, an, he's an awesome dude. He's funny. He's, he's super nice, super personable. I mean, he'll bust your balls to no end. But the good thing about him is he's one of those people where if you bust his balls back, it, it gets just as fun, you know? Right. And the sport, and that was one of the things that Stone had said to me. Stone was like, you know, I want to give you this internship at the sports club because you kind of fit their mold. Like, you'll mm-hmm. get along with these guys. Like, you'll like it there. Like, they'll like you there. And I, I'll always remember the best Zolak memory I had. And it was, there's a lot of them. There was one day I got there, and I'd bring my laptop with me because I'd get there early, and I would, you know, look for stories for the guys or whatever. And I had left my laptop open, and I had gone to get a coffee or something. And I came back, and, like, Zolak had this weird, like, smirk on his face. And I was like, I don't, you know, it's just Zoe. He's just being Zoe. And uh, we're walking together to go to the studio to do the show. And he was like, intern. You know, that, 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 that's some weird stuff you're tweeting out. And I'm like, what? So like, what are you talking about? What do you mean weird stuff I'm tweeting out? And then I realized he had sabotaged my uh, my laptop and oh, had, no. tweeted some pretty, <laughs> had tweeted some pretty gross profanity. But like, that was Zoe, you know? And, right, Like, right. that was just stuff that he did. And, you know, he, he would, you know, try and sabotage me and try to get me uncomfortable on the air. Then I would just go on the mic and give it back to him. And it, it got fun. I mean, he never called me by my real name. I, he never called me Josh. Mm-hmm. He knew my name was Josh, but he would call me Jorge, Christopher Montesanti from the Sopranos. Like, he would call me everything. He'd call me anything, really. He'd call me all types of mean names. And, like, it was just funny, though. And, mm-hmm. uh, he, you know, he was a good guy. That's awesome. That's so cool. Uh, we do have a couple of questions to get to. Uh, submitted by Minor League Rando uh, through Twitter. So I just wanted to ask them. This is kind of shifting away from uh, sports radio and more about um, uh, Boston sports in general. So the first question uh, revolves around the Patriots quarterback situation. Uh, Your thoughts on Cam being potentially uh, washed this season? And is he going to get benched for Jarrett Stidham? Or is it going to be the other way around? You know... If you would have asked me, it's actually kind of funny. I, I had said to Ty the Cruz one day, uh, another uh, WRIU alum, we were golfing. And this was when Cam was still kind of a free agent. And I'm not trying to chew my own horn here, but I said to Cruz, I said, I could see the Patriots bringing in Cam if they could get him on some super team-friendly deal. And they, they ended up being able to do it. And, you know, I, I think it's still kind of early. I would like to see Cam Newton, like, throw a football before anything else because I want to see what his shoulder looks like. I mean, he's definitely motivated. I don't know if you saw the thing he did with Victor Cruz and OBJ. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he's got this massive chip on his shoulder. Now, in terms of how he's going to be and how's the team going to be, you know, I I don't know if if Cam's this massive upgrade from whatever Jarrett Stidham was going to bring you. Like, if you thought the Patriots were going to win, you know, let's say you thought the Pats were going to go 7-9 and with Jarrett Stidham. You know, even if the Pats go then – nine and seven with Cam Newton, you know, was it worth it to bring a guy in on a one year deal when you could have used that year for Stidham? I don't know. Now, you know, catch 22, if Cam comes out and he's, you know, a half of what he was in 2015. And I think you, you extend him. I think Bill, you know, is he going to be the starter? I, I would say so. If you told me, you know, put a gun to my head and said, I had to pick one or the other Cam or Stidham, I would pick Cam just because I think Cam is right now a better quarterback than Jarrett Stidham is. But, you know, Jarrett Stidham definitely knows that system more, but I think Belichick and McDaniels will change their system to fit Cam. And, um, you know, right now I think you're going to see a lot it, it, this year definitely where the Patriots are going to run this two-quarterback system. I, I think there's mm-hmm. going to be some plays where you're going to have Stidham and Cam out there because I think the Pages are going to be able to do a lot of things this year that they weren't able to do when Tom Brady was there. And that's not me saying that I think the Pats are better off with Cam than Brady because I don't think that, but I think the Patriots can be a whole different team with Cam Newton, and I think it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, I I think that this just puts so much more – um, enthusiasm puts so much more hype around the team that that might have been uh, you know completely deflated because Tom Brady left. It's like all right, well now we have Jarrett Stidham. You know we'll see what he can do. This just kind of riles the whole situation up. And whether it's Newton or Stidham and that quarterback position uh, week one, it's going to be a competition now, and people are going to be excited to see what Newton can bring to the table. Yeah, and I think the other thing too with bringing in Newton is. 
this was – it's a lose-lose – I'm sorry, a win-win for Belichick. Belichick can't lose, so not a lose-lose. It's a win-win for Belichick in the sense that he gets canned for practically nothing. Now, I said I would be equally as surprised if Cam took this team 19-0 and they won the Super Bowl as if he got cut week three of preseason. Like, I would be mm-hmm. equally as surprised as each. I, I would expect each. If Cam brings this team 19-0 and wins the Super Bowl and he's 2015 Cam – because he has this massive chip on his shoulder, like he says, you know, I'm that dog, I can still play like he's saying, I wouldn't be surprised. But also, if Belichick cuts him week three of preseason, I wouldn't be surprised. It would be a Bill Belichick type of move. Mm -hmm. I could see him bringing in Cam Newton, this incentive Latin deal, solely just to motivate Jarrett Stidham, because let's be honest, I mean, if it's Jarrett Stidham and Brian Hoyer, I I mean, Jarrett Stidham is winning that quarterback battle. And something that all the great quarterbacks say is, they need some type of motivation. Like, is Jarrett Stidham, what, his second second year in the league. I mean, if he's going up against Brian Hoyer, I mean, what real motivation is it? I mean, Mm -hmm. Tom Brady was motivated as hell when they brought in a young Jimmy Garoppolo, and I think that's what makes a great quarterback. Like, I don't want, if I'm a Patriot fan, I don't want to have Jarrett Stidham saying, oh, I I have the starting job because Brady left. No, you want to earn that starting job. And I think if Cam wasn't there, there wouldn't have been this sense of competition for Stidham. Like, I think he has to work a lot harder now, and I think if you're a Patriot fan, you want to see that. Yeah, it's going to put a, an interesting twist on things in the next couple of uh, weeks for the Patriots in, in this entire season. Uh, did you see Bill Belichick was shooting a Subway commercial in Connecticut yesterday? Yeah, I, I, I did see that. That was a, that was a heavy conversation today on uh, the Greg Hill Morning Show on WEI uh, was, uh, was the fact that Bill Belichick, I guess, is going to be in this new Subway commercial. And, you know... I, that's so, in my opinion, I think that's so Belichick, you know, like with Cam doing all these social media postings and everything. And I think Belichick's now going to be in this subway commercial. And I think a lot of what's going to happen over the next couple of months is going to be a, a big kind of middle finger to Brady kind of, you know, this Patriot way was always, you know, you were, you were out of the spotlight, you were out of social media. And I think Belichick is going to be a lot more kind of lenient to things like that, almost a fight Brady because let's be honest I mean Brady on social media the past couple of months really since he left New England I mean he's been intolerable and you know Bill as much as Bill kind of hides and seems like he's in the shadows we all know Bill is one petty SOB when it when push comes to shove <laughs> that is so true all right and, and then the next question from uh minor league rando was uh he's a Braves fan uh down in Atlanta yep. uh he has them winning the season series against the Red Sox four to one in the five games. Mm-hmm. Your thoughts on that take? Uh, you know, Jack, I think there are a lot of teams this year that could win the season series four to one against the Red Sox. Uh, you know, with their recent signing as of today with Yaziel Puig, uh, I mean that that Braves team is stacked. And when I say stacked, I mean literally stacked! Exclamation point! In the sixty game season, I think that team can be really good. I think they have some issues in you know the starting rotation. They don't really have that bona fide gut, bona fide stud rather, not mm-hmm. good. I think Freed's good. I think Soroka's good. I think Newcomb, he's better out of the bullpen. Fultz Neverwich is, is, is a great, you know, I mean, he's probably your number one. So I don't know. I think def- they're definitely better than the Red Sox. I think Okuna's got a legitimate shot to win an MVP this year. I thought he would have a legitimate shot in 162 game season. Now, that this is based off of the fact that there's going to be uh, MLB season from start to finish of 60 games. I don't know if that even happens, Jack. I, you know, I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if they get halfway through the season and say, we, like, we can't finish that. I mean, mm-hmm. Aroldis Chapman already has coronavirus. It seems Joey Gallo can't get away from it. Uh, Eduardo, Eduardo Rodriguez had it. I mean, there's been a handful of players that already had the virus, and we haven't even had day one yet. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you're seeing what's happening in this NBA bubble situation. So if there is a season... The Braves taken season series for the one. Um, I definitely think that's from a, a Braves perspective. I think three to two would be a little fair, but to minor league randos, uh, for him, I would say yes. I think that the Braves will beat the Red Sox in season series. If it's going to be four to one or three to two, to me, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think they're a better team on paper. And, and I'll say this now, minor league rando, if you are a Braves fan, I think there's a good chance you could see Mookie Betts in the Atlanta Braves uniform Ooh. come next year. So I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's the closest team from where he's from in Nashville 
they already have their two best play, their two franchise players in Albies and Okuna locked up. So, you know, wh- whatever you want to say about Freddie Freeman, I mean, he's a great individual. He's a great player. Uh, he's another one that had the coronavirus, if I'm, uh, I think. But they're already locked up. Okuna and Ozzy Albies bringing Mookie back. I mean, what do you have to lose? I mean, that is, that would be such a talented young core of Ronald Acuna. Mookie Betts and Ozzy Albies. And on top of it, too, like I said, they have so much depth in their farm system that they could do it. I mean, and I really think that they're going to make a push for them. I think the Mookie Betts sweepstakes will come down to a couple of teams, but I think the teams you'll hear from when the season starts kind of progressing is going to be the Red Sox, the Braves, and the Dodgers. Wow. That, I honestly didn't even think about that towards the future, but that uh, that very well could come to fruition. Uh, so Josh, again, thanks so much for being on the show here today. We appreciate having you on. I started a new segment called bets of the week. I haven't been doing okay. well about it. I, I it's, it's gone wrong. Yeah. The only thing I can bet on right now uh, is UFC, which I got my UFC pick, right? Golf yep. and soccer. Yeah. And it's just the, the soccer wins okay. and draws are killing me. Do you have any hot, quick tips yeah. for me to improve here? Well, in UFC, I, I would always say in UFC, you're, you're kind of safe to always pick. If, if it's a championship fight, I usually always pick the champion just because it seems like with UFC, I mean, Dana White just said they have a huge judging problem, which they do. It mm-hmm. always seems like whenever there's a championship fight and it goes the distance, the champion always seems to win, rather, whether he should have won or not. Like, I think Holloway got robbed, and I had money on Holloway, unfortunately. Um, but if you're looking for something quick, something that will make you some money, it's not going to be right away because it's going to have to be if there's a football season. But I would take the Tampa Bay Buccaneers having a better win total than the New England Patriots, but I think it's half a win. I think, the, I think it's, they have the line at half a win uh, that the Bucs will finish better than the Patriots. Everyone wants to say, you know, when you look at the Buccaneers' um, division, you know, he's got to go through Breeze twice, he's got to go through Matt Ryan twice. But as great as Matt Ryan is, I mean, that Falcons team is still a mess, so yep. I could see them beating the Falcons twice. Drew Brees, even if they split to Drew Brees, I think they mm. still beat the Panthers twice. I mean, I don't think Teddy Bridgewater is anything. Teddy Bridgewater is good, but he's nothing special. I don't think he was worth the money that he got. No. And on top of it, too, you know, everyone wants to point fingers and laugh by that Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. But, Jack, little do people know that the Buccaneers last year had a top 10 rush defense of all time. Not, not the season, of all time. Now, yes, their secondary is trash, but I think that Brady and Mike Evans and Chris Godwin and even Gronk, I think they'll put up enough points where they can give up some points. So if you're looking for something quick, something that you can put your money in and kind of forget about and come back in a couple months, I think I would put it on the Buccaneers, half a win uh, over the New England Patriots. And I think on top of it, too, with baseball coming back, I think your money is safe placing it on the New York Yankees to win the AL East. Now, I think the Rays, I think that's a fun pick. I think it's a sexy pick, but I don't think it's a safe pick. If you're Mm. losing some money and you need a lock, I would say the Yankees to win the AL East. I would say Garrett Cole on the over on whatever the strikeout total. Garrett Cole looks unbelievable. He made Clint Frazier look like a double-A baseball player. And I know they're going to have to shrink all the stats, but in 60 games, if they have Garrett Cole strikeouts, at anything like 85 and over, oh, my God, I would pound him. I mean, he'd mm-hmm. get 85 and probably five starts. But then, you know, how many starts is he going to get in a 60-game season? Right. Right. But I would take the Yankees to win the AL East, and I would take the Bucks uh, to finish better than the Patriots. But who knows? Maybe in eight months I'm going to look like an idiot for saying that. <laughs> Josh Toronto, I hope future not. pick expert. Yeah, I would like to say I'm – you know, we still had college basketball. I was doing great. I actually, I don't want to say got in a little bit of trouble, but towards the end of uh, WRIU, my tenure at WRIU, I I got a little bit more ballsy where I would kind of push the envelope a little bit. And it was uh, just as, like, they legalized sports betting. And I would go on WRIU and I would just rip off picks for people, you know. And and some (laughs) days they would be good, and I would put out, like, a five-team parlay that would win. And then the next day I would come on and Cardi would ask me for some pick, and I'd go on the air and say it. And then that would cost Cardi 20 bucks. But mm-hmm. that's Cardi, so I don't mind yeah. making him lose yeah, that's $20 all right. here or there. <laughs> well, Josh, uh, where can uh, the viewers, listeners find you on uh, social media and everything? 
Yeah, so you, I mean, my, my Twitter's, it's, it's real simple. It's nothing too complicated. It's just at Josh Toronto, T-U-R-A-N-O. Uh, you know, and anytime, if any listeners ever want to get a hold of me, just have some casual, uh, quick sports conversation, you can always call in 617-779-7937 uh, at WEI. I'll always be the ones picking up the phones. You guys can always just kind of BS around with me on that. Uh, but until then, it's just my Twitter, and that's about it. Hopefully one day I'll have my own talk show where I can be like, oh, I'm these days 10 to 2. But until then, the grind continues, and it's, a, it's an uphill battle, my friend. Absolutely. But I'm sure, Jack, what, there'll be one day where we'll have each other on again and we'll be able to look at this day and go back and laugh and have some good memories. Of course. Of course. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning, oh, my yeah. friend. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, we hope to have you on again soon, and uh, we hope to connect soon. Maybe we'll hit the links in uh, a couple days or so. Oh, yeah, of course. And as always, Jack, go Rhodey. Go Rhodey.